Hey everybody, I'm Justin with Excel Smith, where our goal is to build better Excel users. On this episode of Solutions, we're going to build dependent drop-down menus for versions of Excel prior to Excel 365. Variability in user input can create massive headaches for data reconciliation and consistency. In this video, we will build a series of dependent drop-down menus for hierarchical information that allow for cleaner data entry or summary. I wouldn't recommend this solution for ad hoc situations as it requires a bit of setup. However, once built, it can easily expand to meet your needs, meaning it's better suited to being part of a template or a dashboard that will be used multiple times. For this solution, we will use these formulas. I've included links to the Microsoft support pages for these formulas in the description. The solution in this video was designed for versions of Excel other than Excel 365. It will work in Excel 365, but Excel 365 has new functions that allow for a simpler solution. In this video, we will use pivot tables, tables, and data validation to drive our equations. I'm really excited to share this one with you. Let's get started. This solution is designed for hierarchical data. In our example, the data begins with region at the highest level and then drills down to product at the most granular level. For example, each region is comprised of divisions. Each division has multiple sales leads, and each sales lead manages a team of salespeople. Lastly, each salesperson has a set of products for which they are responsible. While our example data is centered around a sales model, any type of hierarchical data will work. For example, an org chart or address details or product family. All that matters is that the data begins with the highest level in the leftmost column and then drills down to more granular levels as the data expands to the right. Additionally, each row must contain all of the pieces of the data hierarchy from highest level to the most granular. In other words, each row must be able to stand on its own and contain all levels of information. The first step towards building our solution is to convert our raw data into a table. To do this, select any single cell in the dataset, select Insert, and then press Table. Excel will automatically select the entire dataset. Since our table does have headers, we'll leave this box checked. Press OK, and our data has been converted into a table. Let's give our table a name so that it's easier to reference in our formulas. In this example, we'll name it Data. Next, we need a way to identify all of the unique values within each column in our dataset. We could use Remove Duplicates, however, this option requires a lot of manual maintenance if we ever need to add rows to our dataset. What we want is something that will automatically update if we add additional data. To accomplish this, we can use pivot tables. The next step is to create a pivot table for each of the columns in the dataset. We insert a pivot table by again selecting a single cell in our dataset. Then go to Insert, Pivot Table. For this solution, I like keeping my pivot tables in the same worksheet as my dataset. Each pivot table will be built using just one field in the Rows section. For our first pivot table, let's drag Region to the Rows area of the Pivot Table Builder. Next, we need to remove the Grand Totals label. To do this, select Design in the ribbon, Grand Totals, and then Off for Rows and Columns. Lastly, let's rename the column header of our pivot table to match the contents of the pivot table. For this pivot table, we will replace Row Labels with Region. Through the magic of video editing, I'll speed through the creation of the other four pivot tables. The next piece in the process is to create a pivot table for each pair of values. That means a pivot table for region and division, one for division and sales lead, and so on. We'll create this pivot table the same way as the previous ones. Ensure only one cell in our data is selected, and press Pivot Table from the Insert option in the ribbon bar. Again, let's place these in the same worksheet. Like with the single value pivot tables we created earlier, we will be dragging both field names into the Rows section. Next, we need to make some visual changes for this solution to work. First, let's convert our pivot table from a compact form factor to tabular. With any part of the pivot table selected, click Design in the ribbon, Report Layout, then Show in Tabular Form. Next, let's remove all of the totaling within the pivot table. We'll remove the subtotals first by clicking on Subtotals, then Don't Show Subtotals. Let's do the same thing for the grand total by selecting Grand Totals, then Off for Rows and Columns. Next, we need the values in the first column to repeat for each value in the second column. The equation we will be building will break with the blank cells currently in the first column. To update this, click Report Layout, 
then repeat all line items. Lastly, as an optional step, we can turn off the collapse capability. It's not necessary, but I like to remove it as it's not needed, and I think the icons clutter up the table. Let's select Pivot Table Analyze in the ribbon bar, then deselect the plus minus buttons option. We need to repeat these steps for all header pairs. We will always have one less pivot table than the number of columns. Again, I'll speed up the video to expedite the pivot table creation process. We have completed the data setup for our dependent drop-down menus. By converting our data into a table, when refreshed, our pivot tables will automatically update with any new rows added into our data. Now that we have the data structure set up, let's begin building our drop-down menus. Our drop-down menus will allow you to start your filtering at any of the columns and then filter the column immediately to its right. This means that you could start by selecting a region, which would filter the options for division. Selecting a division would filter the choices for sales lead, and so on. The way we will be building our solution, you also have the flexibility to start your selection with any column. For example, we could start with sales lead, which would filter salesperson. The only limit for the solution is that the filtering only occurs in cells immediately to the right of a cell with a selection. In other words, if you select division, sales lead will contain a filtered list, but salesperson will not until you select a sales lead. To hold our drop-down menus, I have built a table with the same headers as our data set. We will be placing a drop-down menu in each of the columns from region through product. The last two columns, units sold and revenue, will be summed based on the data in the preceding five columns. I've also created a section for a total summary of units sold and revenue in the first two rows of the worksheet. The next piece we need is a way to determine which values should be in our dropdowns. For this, we will need a helper cell for each of the options except region. These helper cells will contain references to the values in the pivot tables we built previously. We don't need a helper cell for region because its dropdown will always contain all of the available options within the region column in our data table. The logic for our helper equation is to first check the criteria one column to the left of the helper cell's corresponding drop-down menu. For example, the region helper cell drives the drop-down in the division column. This means the equation needs to check to see if the cell in the region column is blank. If there is no value in the region cell, we want the division drop-down to contain all possible divisions. We accomplish this by creating a range from the beginning of our division pivot table through the end of our division pivot table. We can determine the last row of our pivot table by using the count a function. Lastly, we need the output of our equation to be a string containing a range as this will later be fed into an indirect formula. Now that we have the true condition built, we can build the functionality for the false condition, which is when the preceding region cell is not blank. The false condition will be referencing the pivot tables of heading pairs we created earlier. Like our true condition, this will also be returning a string of a range. However, there is a little more logic needed to determine which values to pull. What we want is a range that pulls from the second value in our pair, but is set to the height corresponding to the value in the first field in the pair. For example, when we select East as our region, we want to select the range of divisions that correspond to a region of East. In our data, that would be the range T2 through T3. The first component is setting the column of our division range, which is column T. To determine the row, we use a match function that takes the region as its first parameter, the entire column containing the region as the second parameter, which is column S, and a zero as the last parameter, as we only want to return an exact match. Since the match function stops at the first match, this will return the first instance of the region in our pivot table. Next, we build the end of our range by first concatenating a T, which ties to the division column. Lastly, we need a way to identify the row for the last instance of the given region. Unfortunately, we can't use any of the lookup functions as these return the first instance of a match. The solution for this video is to use max and row inside an array formula. We use an if statement to compare all of the region matches in the region column. We set the true parameter to a row formula containing the entire region column as its parameter. This results in an array containing the row numbers for any matches and falses where there is no match. By wrapping this if statement inside of max, we will be returning the max or last row containing our region value. Using pivot tables ensures our data is always grouped appropriately. This is an array formula, which means we must submit it by pressing Control, Shift, and Enter. Since we have not selected a region, 
The result of this equation is the range of cells containing all of the divisions. In our example, that's K2 through K9. If we had East selected for our region, the equation would return T2 through T3. We can now copy and paste these formulas into the remaining helper cells. We just need to update the column reference in the true parameter to correspond to the appropriate single column pivot table. We also need to update the columns and the false condition to match the appropriate columns in the pivot tables containing two fields. Lastly, we need to update the parameter within the isBlank function to reference the cell one column to the left of the data column corresponding to our helper cell. For the product helper cell, this reference will be the cell in the salesperson column. Now that we have completed our helper cells, we can build our drop-down menus. We build our drop-down menus by selecting Data from the ribbon, then Data Validation. Inside the Data Validation pop-up, select List from the first drop-down menu. For our Region column, we will directly reference the Region pivot table as there is no filtering possible for this value. We do this using an indirect function. Similar to the helper cells we built previously, we supply the range as a string inside the indirect function. The beginning of our string will reference row 2 in the appropriate column, which is I2. Since we know all possible values are contained inside a single column, we can go ahead and add our column reference, I. We will lock our range so that it does not update as the table expands. Next, we build the ending value for our range by concatenating a count A function, which takes the entire column corresponding to the region pivot table. By using count A, we are able to determine the last row containing our values. That's it for our region cell. We can now select the dropdown and see that it contains all four regions. The next four columns will contain a slightly different formula as they will be referencing the helper cells we built in columns I through L. Again, we select data validation from the data option in the ribbon. Since we have already built the logic to determine the possible options, we simply use an indirect function passing in reference to our helper cells as the only parameter. In this case, we only lock the column as we want the row to update as the table expands. We now repeat this process for the remaining three options, making sure to pass in the corresponding helper cell as the parameter to the indirect functions. We've completed building our dependent dropdown menus. Let's try them out. First, we'll select West from the Region option. Now, when we select Division, we will only see the divisions corresponding to the West region. Let's select Division 7. Our sales lead values are now filtered to show only the sales leads in Division 7. We can continue selecting options all the way down to Product. If we want to remove any of the values, we can simply select the cell and press Delete. This will only remove the selection, it will not remove the dropdown. Let's clear our selections and see what happens if we begin our selection with sales lead. I'll select all three values and press Delete. I'll then select the dropdown for sales lead. Since we have not defined a division, we are presented with all possible sales leads. Let's choose D marks. Now we can select from a list of salespeople that report to D marks. However, if we try to select product without first selecting a salesperson, there will be no filtering. The filtering only occurs in cells that immediately follow another cell containing a selection. To refine our product list, we first must select a salesperson. We can select C. McDonald. Now, the product options have been filtered to only show the products owned by C. McDonald. One more call out. The selections will not automatically change if you make a change to any of your dropdowns. For example, if we change D marks to J. Finch, C. McDonald does not automatically update. However, if we access the dropdown menu, we see that the options have been filtered to show the salespeople reporting to J. Finch. Like the salesperson, the product won't automatically update. Since we changed the salesperson, we need to make a new selection from the products menu. Since our selections are housed inside a table, we can expand the number of rows by simply dragging down the lower right-hand corner. Each row will contain its own unique and independent set of drop-down menus. Lastly, by using a table and pivot tables to hold our data, we can update the available options by adding additional rows to our data table and refreshing all pivot tables. The formulas driving our drop-down menus will automatically expand to reflect any additional options. In this example, we've created a view that allows us to view total units sold and total revenue for the values we select. Another use for this solution is to control the information submitted in an input form. Here, we have included the drop-down menus alongside other columns. I've grouped the helper cells and collapsed them to make the input form cleaner. The results of this form could drive downstream applications. By using dependent drop-down menus, you make it easier on the individuals completing the form, 
while also ensuring the consistency of your data. You now have a solution for combining different Excel elements to build a set of dependent drop-down menus. The number of dependencies can flex to suit your needs. Simply add however many pivot tables and data validation equations you need to cover all of your variables. If you found this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and tell your friends. Also, leave a comment below if you have an example where you could use a set of dependent drop-down menus. Thanks for watching.